They spray our skies interact with, these with the magnetic toxic chemicals. Space travel is Mars is a I'm Rich Lund, welcome to another episode of Debunk the Funk. In episodes one and two of Debunk the Funk, we gave kind of an overview of the flat earth idea. In those two episodes, we used both the sun's movement during a sunset and its constant visual size throughout the day to expose some of the major holes that the flat earth idea already has. In today's episode, we're going to look at a totally different yet equally major issue that the flat earth doctrine has. And I'm sure you guessed what it is based upon the title of the video, Gravity. For someone who's not that well versed in the flat earth ideas, it might not be immediately obvious why flat earth believers completely reject and quite detest the concept of gravity. But it's for a pretty simple reason. If gravity exists, a flat earth cannot. When experiments that reveal new findings about our understanding of gravity are actually conducted, flat earth is usually bending over backwards to try to explain away why it wasn't true and why their findings weren't accurate. The two ideas are not compatible. If the Earth were a disk, because of gravity, the edges of that disk would be pulled more and more towards the center. Everything would be pulled towards the center. The mass of the rest of the Earth would be pulling it in that direction. As more and more mass got towards the center, well, that gravitational pull would be equal in all directions, eventually forming a sphere. Not a perfect sphere, mind you. I don't know if any such thing exists other than mathematically. But an approximate sphere, which is called a spheroid. For the sake of simplicity though, from this point forward in the video, whenever we mean a spheroid, we're still just going to say sphere. And this is actually pretty commonplace in nature. When there's an attractive inward force in all directions, spheres tend to show up. It's true for water droplets. When they're left of their own devices and not interfering with some other object, they form a sphere due to the inward attractive force of surface tension. Or even the spherical nature of atoms themselves, where electrons are all equally pulled in to the center positive nucleus. Bottom line, and even flat earth proponents would agree with this, if the earth were flat, gravity would not be able to exist as we understand it. Now hold on, some of you have dropped a hammer on your toe before, and you're probably sitting there thinking, how is it possible that somebody could deny the existence of gravity? Haven't they ever seen something fall down before? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. I've mentioned it a few times in various episodes that when it comes to conspiracy theories or just pseudoscience in general, there's definitely a strong advantage to being vague. When someone's vague about a certain topic or area of their belief, well then they can never be tested and disproven because they never actually put it to words. They never pin down exactly what it was that they believe. And while there's a myriad of websites out there about it, in many cases they don't agree on these areas where vagueness has occurred. The best I can do though is just describe to you how other flat earth proponents have described their belief in gravity or lack thereof. Most often what I encounter, whether it be from websites or actual conversations online with flat earth enthusiasts, is that gravity does not exist. Yes, things fall, but it's not because of some force called gravity. So naturally you might ask, why do the objects fall? The common go-to flat earth answer for that question is that an object falls because it is more dense than the material it falls through. It's not gravity, it's just density, the end. Now. I don't know about you, but I know that I don't find that answer very satisfying. To say that gravity doesn't exist, things just fall because they're more dense, it's the same kind of thing as saying light doesn't exist, some things are just brighter than others. But a very important question that is not answered by just throwing out the magic word density deals with direction. Here is a squish ball, and I'm going to let it go. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Now, nothing crazy or fantastical happened. We watched this fall, just as we'd expect. But when I say the word fall, that word has wrapped up in it already a direction. Down. So let's describe what we saw in an equally accurate way. Instead of saying when I let go of the ball, we saw the ball fall, let's talk about how when I let go of the ball, the ball moves. Now, why did the ball move? Already, the density answer is broken. If one were to try to say that the ball moved down because below it was air and the ball is more dense than the air, I can easily point out that there's also air in front of it and behind it, to the left and to the right of it, and above it. So if this ball is more dense than the air above it, 
Well, why didn't it move in that direction? The density answer cannot handle even that simple question. If people are examining and looking at and exploring the ideas of Flat Earth, what perhaps isn't apparent to them when they first encounter Flat Earth's rejection of gravity is that it's not just a rejection of gravity. At the same time they reject gravity, what they are really rejecting is Newton's first law of motion. Objects at rest, so not moving, will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Granted, that's not all of Newton's first law of motion, but that's the part that they are rejecting. When I let go of our ball, it moved. Newton's first law of motion would say there must have been an unbalanced force that acted on it. And further, because we all saw which direction it moved, we also know the direction that force is in. The density explanation cannot do anything to describe to you why objects fall in the direction that they do. Let's be fair though, I have encountered some Flat Earth proponents, most of them, who do recognize that yes, weight exists. Objects do have weight. Still, they reject the idea that weight is a force, and specifically, a force due to gravity. So, let's ask this question. Is weight a force? And how do we know? What I have here is a spring scale, and the spring's the important part of it. If I want to stretch this spring, if I want the length of the spring to increase, then I must exert a force on that spring in order to increase its length. In other words, I think we all agree, you need a force to stretch a spring. For example, I have here a 1 inch cubic neodymium magnet. I'm very careful with this. It's a pretty powerful magnet. This magnet will be able to exert a magnetic force of attraction on our metal hook here. And so this magnet can attract and pull on with a magnetic force our hook, which is pulling on the plastic inside, which pulls on the spring. And because our scale is calibrated, we can actually read, when we pull it as far as it can before it lets go, we can read how many newtons of magnetic force must have been pulling on the hook before it let go. Okay, both flat earth enthusiasts and globetrotters, are we all still in agreement? You need a force to stretch a spring. Now here, I have a weight. And this is actually a situation where I have no idea if the pun is intended or not. I have a weight. Now I'm going to take the weight and I'm going to place it inside of a clear bag, which has a string hanging from it. And the string is there, so that way I can attach our string to our hook on our spring scale. Now I'm going to do something that might seem a little silly here, but it's to establish something. I'm going to lay the bag and the spring down on a shelf. As you can see, with the weight in the bag, attached to the string, attached to the hook, which is part of our spring scale, the spring is not being stretched. I know, I know, duh, right? But I'm establishing something here. Just having this weight in this bag, attached to the string, attached to the hook, is not stretching the spring. No force is just automatically being exerted on this spring. But what if we let the bag hang off of our shelf? We've already agreed a force is necessary to stretch the spring. The spring is being stretched, so a force must be being exerted on it. Something is pulling on this spring. Now before we did this, we established that when the setup was just sitting on the shelf, no force was being exerted on the spring. But when we have the weight and the bag hanging off the edge of the shelf, not supported by the shelf, our spring gets stretched. A force is being exerted on that spring. And when we go through the chain of what's pulling on what, eventually we get to the dead end of the weight. What's pulling on the weight? Now, obviously, I would say that it is the Earth that is pulling on our suspended weight, and it's doing so with the attractive force that we call gravity. But what would a flat Earth proponent say is pulling on the weight? That, I can't be sure of. I suppose any Flat Earth believer who's watching this is welcome to go down into the comments section and try to explain that to us. And also, I don't wish to imply that Flat Earth wouldn't have an answer for this, but what we might see from this demonstration that we've done here is that any answer that they provide would have to admit that there is a force pulling on the spring, and that yes, that force is in the downward direction. And I think, I hope, it should be pretty obvious since our hanging mass isn't falling, trying to invoke the idea of density does absolutely nothing to explain how our spring is being stretched. Density is not stretching our spring. 
Thank you for checking out this episode of Debunk the Funk. If you feel like you got something out of it, hey, that thumbs up like is always appreciated. I'm Rich Lund, here to remind you, the world needs critical thinkers. Make sure you're one of them. See you next time.